So wonderful to have you here, Tom. Great to be here. In front of you, you have uh, our fantastic colleagues here at the Stockholm Resilience Center. We are both coming directly from the World Economic Forum in Davos. I don't have to present you, but just as a little reminder, uh, Tom is, as you all know, apart from being an internationally renowned author, the international columnist at New York Times, three Pulitzer Prize winners, six top books, and now writing a new book. And we're looking forward to get a little bit of Great. insights on these thinking. And I thought I'd, we'd just jump right at it. My conclusion after having had the privilege of, of interacting with you over, over the years is that we share a very strong common entry point on the challenges we're facing right now. Scientifically, we look at the world from the perspective of the great acceleration of exponential rise in human pressures on the planet. We've entered a whole new geological epoch, the Anthropocene, and we are, all of us, exploring social ecological pathways for a resilient, sustainable future for humanity within a safe operating space on Earth. And, and you have shared through our dialogues this, this very, very exciting combination of the three Moore's law that you have as the entry point in your new book. And it would be wonderful to kick off on that. What do you mean by those three interconnected, <coughs> complex exponential rises in a, in a turbulent world? Uh, well, Jan, first of all, thank you. It's a treat to be here. Thank you all for, for uh, coming out. Um, uh, let me talk just a second about the book and its structure, and then fit in the three rises, if I, mm -hmm. if I could. So I'm, I, I'm working on a new book that's called Thank You for Being Late. Um, and uh, you should have thanked me. I think we're a few minutes late here. So, um, uh, so everyone should be grateful. Exactly. And uh, the title comes from I'd be meeting people in Washington, D.C., where I lived for breakfast over the last year. And people would come 15, 20 minutes late sometimes. They'd say, uh, time, I'm really sorry. Is the, the weather, the traffic, the subway, the dog ate my homework. Um, is my kids. And um, I found myself over the last year spontaneously saying to them, uh, actually, Johan, uh, thank you for being late. Uh, because you were late, I've been eavesdropping on their conversation. Uh, I've been people watching the lobby, fantastic. And I just connected two ideas I've been struggling with for the last year. So thank you for being late. And people started saying, well, you're welcome. <laughs> and uh, and um, uh, I realized that that was the, the book, I, uh, what I wanted to call my book, because the theme of the book is that, uh, as, as you on uh, uh, it suggested is, is that we're, the world is accelerating, I'm going to talk about that for a minute, but the subtext of the book is that the faster the world gets, the more uh, I've come to realize that everything that is old and slow uh, matters more than ever. Everything you cannot download, everything you have to upload the old-fashioned way uh, uh, with good teaching, uh, good parenting, and strong communities. So the book is about the tension between the two. Um, uh, and the way the book is built um, is that it, it's built around actually how, how you write a column. Um, uh, because a, um, uh, a column is actually an act of chemistry. So um, uh, a new story is meant to inform, but a column is actually meant to provoke. Um, so I'm either in the heating business or the lighting business. I'm either stoking up an emotion in you or I'm illuminating something for you and hopefully producing a reaction. And if I do it right, I'll produce one of 12 reactions. Uh, you'll read my column and you'll say, I, I, I didn't know that that's a good reaction. I didn't know there was a resilience institute in Stockholm. It's amazing. Uh, I never connected those things. Um, I never looked at it that way. Your favorite, you live for this. It happens four times a year. You said exactly what I felt. God, God bless you. Um, happens four times a year. Um, I want to kill you dead, you and all your offspring. Um, that happens a lot, actually. Um, so your column is meant to produce a reaction. If you do it right, it'll produce one of these dozen reactions. And what actually, to produce heat or light requires a chemical reaction. So, um, uh, and the chemistry is three things. One is your own value set. What do you stand for? What do you believe? Are you a libertarian, a Marxist, a capitalist, a socialist, a Keynesian? How do you lean into the world? Second, how do you think the machine works? So I'm always carrying around in my head a working theory of what are the biggest forces shaping more things in more places in more ways on more days. Because as a columnist, I'm trying to take my value set and move the machine. And if I don't know how it works, I either won't move it or I'll move it in the wrong direction. Mm. And lastly, what have you learned about people and culture? 
how the machine affects people and cultures and how different people and culture respond to the machine. Mix all those three things together, stir, bake for 45 minutes, and if you do it right, you'll produce a column. So what this book basically explores is first, what is my value set? Where do I come from? And that chapter is called Always Looking for Minnesota. Because I grew up in a small town in Minnesota in the 50s and 60s at a time and a place where politics worked. And that deeply shaped my values. I grew up in a really strong small town community. Second, how do I think the machine works? And that's the context for Jan's question. So I think where we are today, I was deeply influenced a year and a half ago by um, a book I read called The Second Machine Age by Eric Brynjolfsson and Andy McAfee. And what uh, they argued was that the first machine age was built on the steam engine, which doubled in power every 70 years. But we're now in the second machine age. And the second machine age is built on the microchip, which according to Moore's law, doubles in power every 24 months. And what um, Andy and Eric argued in their book is that um, they, they use a very famous old story here at Silicon Valley all the time about the man who invented chess. Mm -hmm. And he man invented chess, he gave the game to the king. The king loved it, how can I reward you, good sir? He said, I just want to feed my family, what would you like? He said, I'd just like you to take one kernel of rice and put it on the first square in the chessboard, two on the second, four on the next, eight on the next, 60 on the next, keep doubling it, my family will be fine. The king, not having taken basic math, said, I'll be happy to do that, um, not realizing that when you double something 63 more times, the number you get is 18 quintillion, okay? Um, more rice than existed in the whole world. So what Andy and Eric argued in their book, and this is what really was the germ of got me started, was that we just entered the second half of the chessboard on Moore's Law, where the doubling starts to get very, very big. And that's why you see self-driving cars, computers that can beat anybody in chess, etc. So what I told them was, you guys, I love your theory, but it's incomplete as an explanation of the world. Because there are two other forces that just entered the second half of their chessboard at the same time. And they're the other two largest forces on the planet. One is the market, that's my shorthand for globalization, and the other is mother nature, that's climate and biodiversity loss. Mm -hmm. So if you actually take a mother, climate and biodiversity loss, what do we talk about? We talk about the hockey stick. Uh, for climate change and biodiversity loss. Well, if you actually put globalization, all the indices of globalization on a graph, it looks exactly like a hockey stick. If you put all the, if you put Moore's law on a graph, what does it look like? A hockey stick. So in fact, all three of the largest forces on the planet right now, I would argue the market, mother nature, and Moore's law are in simultaneous, either linear or nonlinear acceleration, depending on how you measure it. And it's the interaction between the three I argue, is the machine that's shaping more things in more places and more ways and more days. And, and so, so when we discussed this uh, just a few days back, actually, in, in Davos, I should share perhaps that it was triggered not least by the fact that the World Economic Forum, not surprisingly, focuses so much of its effort on one of these hockey sticks, which is the fourth industrial revolution, yeah. while not addressing um, seriously enough the need to encapsulate this within a stable and resilient earth system and encapsulating this within a mind shift with regards to values and yes. equity and fairness, which is one of the, or perhaps the most important challenge that humanity faces. And you pointed out then that this conclusion from your side is that we've reached a new crossroads. Humanity is really at a new crossroads and you've identified four key, let's say, important social environmental dimensions that you'll be exploring, governance, trust, and a few others. It would be wonderful if you'd like to sure. share with you, because I think that can inspire not least our science in the future, where you have so many colleagues here doing research from management to governance to behavioral change in different ecosystems and societies across the world. So let me, yeah, let me try to take that up. You know, I, I, again, I'll step back a little mm -hmm. bit and get into the architecture. So the, my first part of the book is about my own value set, always looking for Minnesota. And the next part, I look at how the machine works. Yeah. So I start with um, Moore's Law. And the way I basically explain it is this little dot device called a computer uh, is actually built on five parts, uh, five basic parts. It's, there's the CPU, the chip, the Moore's Law thing, the processor, uh, the storage chip, um, the networking um, that connects them all, the software and the sensor. My computer, like yours, has a camera in it, that's a sensor. 
Um, and if you actually look um, at all five today, so I build that chapter around um, uh, five different people. One is Gordon Moore, who I got to interview for the 50th anniversary of Moore's Law, which was just last October, um, uh, for, 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 the, for processing. Um, I interviewed Doug Cutting, the founder of Hadoop, uh, which is all about storage. If you don't know what Hadoop is, you don't know about the most important company in the world that you've never heard of. Um, uh, the third I built around uh, GitHub, which is about software, and Chris Wanstroth, the founder of that. Uh, the fourth I built around Qualcomm, uh, which is about networking. Uh, Berwin Jacobs, who was the first guy to duct tape together a smartphone and a, uh, sorry, a dumb phone and a Palm Pilot, and say, yeah, what would happen if we actually put these together? Um, long before Steve Jobs thought of it, that was his son, Paul Jacobs. And the last is um, uh, the sensor, which is actually built around General Electric. So actually what's happened, in my view, all five are in a Moore's Law. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they all converged in 2007, and this chapter is probably called 2007, because 2007 was an amazing vintage. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of those years that changed the world. Uh, the iPhone came out in 2007, Hadoop started in 2007. You go through the list and see everything that started in 2006, 2008 in that window. Um, by the way, we were all completely distracted by the global subprime crisis. The Stockholm Resilience Center was born in 2007. Sure, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, as another, as thing. another thing. Anyway. So they all merged in 2007 into something we call now the cloud. Um, but I never use the term the cloud because it sounds, sounds so soft, y'all. <laughs> sounds so fluffy. Sounds so benign. Sounds like a Joni Mitchell song. I've looked at clouds from both. This ain't no fucking cloud. Okay, <laughs> this is a supernova. This is the greatest release of energy into the hands of human beings since fire. That's what I think is going on. This is, in, supernova is the largest force in nature. It's the explosion of a star. Only this isn't a one-time explosion. This is an explosion, technologically, at an ever-accelerating pace and scope. This is a big deal. And you all just happen to be here. As I said to Johan, you know, someone was here when Gutenberg invented the printing press. And this is a Gutenberg-like inflection point. And some monk said to some priest, now that is really cool. That is really cool. I don't have to write all these Bibles out longhand. I can just stamp them out. You were here at a similar moment. I date it to February 4th, 2011. I think the moment really happened on an American game show called Jeopardy. There were three contestants. One was named Brad Rutter, the other was named Craig Jennings, and the third went only by his last name, or was it her last name? Watson. Watson passed on the first question, and the second question on the show was, used by a dealer in a casino and worn on the foot of a horse. Uh -uh, two and a half seconds, Watson bu buzzed in before the two humans and answered in pure Jeopardy style, what is a shoe? And for the first time in the history of the world, a computer answered a question posed in natural language and figured out a pun using cognitive reasoning faster than two human beings. And the world was never again the same. So where are we now? That's my lead up. What this supernova is doing is empowering two trends, and we have never been here before. In 1944, 1945 basically, for the first time in the history of the world, we, we, real, we woke up one day and discovered that a government had a device called an atomic bomb that actually could destroy all of us. And since then, since Hiroshima, we've been living in a world where a government could actually destroy all of humanity. We now live in a world where a single person can destroy all of humanity. That's one side of the crossroad we're living in. But the other side of the crossroad, we're at an amazing time, and this institute is a reflection of it. We also now live in a world where we could actually, actually save all of humanity. We actually have the resources, if we applied them right, to feed everyone on this planet, to house everyone on this planet, to clothe everyone on this planet, we have never been at an intersection in history where we had, thanks to this supernova, the ability to destroy everything and save everything in the hands of human beings. We have never been more godlike 
than we are today. And therefore, the values we bring to this story have never been more important. Mm. And that's such a profound, deep insight, which also inspires a lot of the, the science going on here. And it, it takes me very naturally to, to, the, to the conclusion that we've drawn here, which is we have just the last few years approached as you, as you describe it so nicely, a kind of a tipping point, a social tipping point, you know. Will the world tip back towards conventional business as usual or are we tipping towards global sustainability as the entry point for human prosperity in the future? And that tipping point is from all science showing very clearly that it's not an incremental journey we have ahead, but it's a transformation journey. So we're exploring increasingly the science on what, what does it take to go to scale with social ecological transformations towards global sustainability. And as you and I discussed earlier this morning, look at climate, look at biodiversity, look at marine issues, look at resources in general. We have basically just one generation to transform ourselves into a resilient future. And, and I wonder what's your thinking there in terms of does this require multiple bottom-up changes in human values or is it a journey of uh, top-down uh, governance steering from, from, the, from above, so to say? Or what, what's your reflections on, on how on earth do we actually stimulate a journey towards a future along the lines that you've pointed out? I mean, if we have, you said to me this morning, your starting point is we have a triple Moore's law in terms of pressures, but we don't have a Moore's law for human values. Yep because they change slowly. So what do we do? So um, uh, the last third of my book is about that subject. It's about people and culture. Mm. How the machine's affecting people and culture and people and culture affecting the machine. So um, I approach it with, I have three chapters uh, that are interrelated. Um, uh, the first is about mother nature as mentor and model, which is a concept out of um, biomimicry. And I believe that what we've created with our hands now is a system of systems a system of ne a network of networks, a network of data and telecommunications that is more interconnected, hyperconnected, and interdependent and complex that it mirrors only one other thing in our experience, and that's the natural world. So um, it, that being the case, I thought, well, if what we need in this world, as Johan said, is resilience, and in an interdependent world, what do you want? You want healthy interdependencies, so we all rise together and don't fall together. Um, and uh, uh, we want more U.S.-Canada relations, fewer Russia-Ukraine relations, you know, to talk about healthy and unhealthy interdependencies. God, where should I go for advice, I thought. Well, why don't I go to this, uh, this woman I know who has uh, 4.5 billion years of experience in dealing with climate change, and that's Mother Nature. Um, and uh, because what we're in the middle of are three simultaneous climate changes at once. One in the market, one in Mother Nature, and one in Moore's Law, and they're all transformative. So how does Mother Nature deal with climate changes? Well, I argue she's got about a half a dozen killer apps. Um, she's incredibly adaptable. She's incredibly pluralistic. Mother Nature loves pluralism. She's incredibly sustainable. Everything is food. Eat food, seed, poop, eat food, seed, poop. You know, it's all a uh, closed circle. Um, she's incredibly small-scale network. She loves community. Um, she's incredibly ownership and stewardship oriented. Plants and animals have their territory. Um, and uh, she's incredibly entrepreneurial. She, any open space she'll fill in. And she's incredibly, um, believes in ownership. Uh, sorry, she, she, does, she believes in the laws of bankruptcy. Uh, she does not believe in state-owned industries. Uh, Mother Nature kills all her failures and um, uh, she uses those resources to reinforce her successes. So I basically say countries and cultures that mirror those attributes are the ones that are actually going to thrive the most, that are most adaptable, most pluralistic, most ownership oriented, most network, small scale networked, et cetera. So that's the challenge, it seems to me. At one level, we need to mimic mother nature's killer apps, but the problem is she gets there unconsciously. She produces all those killer apps unconsciously, and we need to do it consciously. So um, that, I think, is a real challenge. It's the one I think Johan's alluding to that this institute is dedicated to. So then how do we do it consciously? 
Well, we start from the fact that, again, human beings, Mother Nature is determined. We are not determined. We do crazy, irrational, funny, violent, human. Um, we, we are totally irrational beings. There's nothing determined about our outcome. So to me, we have four killer apps we need to apply. This chapter is called, Is God in Cyberspace? Um, and I'll explain why. So I, I've been on book tour since 1989 with different books. And in 1999, I was in Portland, Oregon. And I was on book tour for a book I'd written called Lexus and the Olive Tree. And a man stood up in the balcony, I can still see him up there, and said, Mr. Friedman, I have a question for you. Best question I ever got on book tour. Is God in cyberspace? And I thought, wow, I've never been asked that question before. Is God in cyberspace? I said, I don't know. And there's nothing more embarrassing than standing in front of 2,500 people. And somebody asks you a really heartfelt question, and you have no answer. So I got home and I called my spiritual teacher. He's a, a rabbi who lives in Amsterdam, Svee Marx. I said, Svee, I got a question on book tour the other day. Is God in cyberspace? What should I have said? And he said, well, uh, Tom, in our faith tradition, we have two concepts of the Almighty. Uh, one is that um, he, the Almighty is the Almighty and he smites evil and rewards good. And if that's your view of God, he sure isn't in cyberspace. Oh. Because it's full of pornography, gambling, cheating, lying, uh, people saying bad things about other people. Uh, God clearly is not in cyberspace. But we have another competing concept of the Almighty, which is that God manifests himself by how we behave. So if you want God to be in cyberspace, you've got to bring him there, or her there, by how you behave. There. So to me, this is a metaphor for the challenge we have. We've created a whole new realm that needs governance. So I think our killer apps are fourfold. On the one hand, we need governance today, rules and regulations, because people are crazy and irrational. There are people who will use cyberspace, as we know, for cyber warfare, for uh, cyber thievery, to break into all your bank accounts. They'll do bad things. We need old time governance from the top down. But secondly, in this kind of world, where everyone is super empowered, we also need inspiration. You need to inspire people. We need all kinds of better norms and behavior from the bottom up, because that's the only way you can govern such a system. We can't have a policeman at every website, okay? So the example I give is that um, uh, last year it was discovered that um, YouTube was running Miller beer ads on ISIS videos. Um, uh, this, is, this is a true story. Um, uh, you know, the way YouTube is set up, it's set up that users are report people if they use bad language. If I go on and start preaching neo-Nazi ideas, you know, someone will call up and say, you got Dave Friedman's on YouTube channel, blah, 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 saying these things. But um, it was never set up to actually notice which commercials the algorithm was putting up on which videos. So the algorithm probably detected a lot of young males were watching ISIS videos and started putting up Miller beer ads. So that's what happens when you have an interconnected, hyperconnected world, but actually no moral values being applied to it. And that needs to be governed both from the top down and from the bottom up. So we need more governance and more inspiration. But secondly, you need more trust. You, we need engines of trust, and that for me is community. Because I think the world we're going into, the federal government's too distant and too paralyzed, at least in my country, and the single family unit is too weak, and in my country, way too many single parent households. I think the governing unit for the 21st century is gonna be the strong community that can leverage both sides of this equation. And basically, communities are important to me because they are engines of trust building. So I actually use, I, I end my book where I began in the small town in Minnesota. And I use this town to show how it is an engine of trust building. And I'll give you the story that I begin the chapter with, which is, uh, so I live in this town, St. Louis Park, 30 minutes outside of Minneapolis, 44,000 people. So in 2007, they decided they're going to be the first town in Minnesota to build a public free Wi-Fi system, free public Wi-Fi. And they contract out to a company in Massachusetts that has a system of solar powered Wi-Fi towers and they buy it, $1.7 million, a lot for my little town. And the system completely fails the first winter 
the ice stays on the solar panels and the whole thing fails and turns into a giant white elephant. Now they put up this system after a hundred, a <coughs> hundred town meetings over what system they should choose. The day it was taken down, I, I interviewed the town CTO, Chief Technology Officer, who had a heart attack over the failure. But uh, before he had his heart attack, the day they announced they're taking it down, he went to the Harvest Moon Cafe next to St. Louis Park City Hall for lunch, right after they made the announcement. And a man came up to him in the cafe and said, you're the Wi-Fi guy, aren't you? And he sort of steeled himself, and the guy said, too bad that didn't work. What are we going to try next? Mm -hmm. Do you know the level of trust you have to have in a system to produce that reaction? Now compare that, if you follow the story in America four or five years ago of Solyndra, it's a solar power company that the Obama administration funded um, uh, as part of a venture capital thing, part of our stimulus to do solar power, $500 million. The thing completely failed, it turned out to be a white elephant. There are only three questions in Washington. Who did that? When do we put them on trial? When do we send them to the electric chair? Okay? Um, so in Washington, you have the exact opposite of trust. So when a community where you have trust, people can be incredibly adaptable, incredibly pluralistic, um, incredibly entrepreneurial. When there's trust in the room, that's like a hard floor. Do you realize how, how you can jump off a hard floor? When there's no trust in the room, it's like a sandy beach. You can't jump anywhere. And so the reason we need these trusts, this level of trust gets back to Mother Nature. That's the only way we will, on our own, adopt Mother Nature's killer apps. Only then we become pluralistic, <coughs> sustainable, adaptable, etc. cetera. So, mm. so that's, I think, the challenge of governance. It's, it's complicated. But we need both governance from the top, governance from, governance from the bottom, but also governance as engines of trust because mm. trust is actually the single most important fuel in the world. I think this is very important and inspiring for us, and particularly your, your conclusion about the kind of hybrid strategy of combining top-down, bottom-up governance and, and seeing the community as a, as a kind of a key scale. And I would argue that uh, um, many in here would say uh, that that's where we're doing a lot of our kind of field research while always connecting, you know, to the, large to the global yeah. scale and interactions and feedbacks and, and thresholds, but also down to the um, local scale. Now, recognizing this, and, and as I mentioned before, we're very inspired, for example, by the late Nobel laureate Lynn Ostrom mm -hmm. and her work on polycentric governance from below, but we're also very heavily engaged in providing science into the global governance system, from the Sustainable Development Goals to the Paris COP21. And I'm just curious, uh, from your perspective, having, I know, followed this very closely as well, what's your view on, on the global governance <coughs> capacity in the world today? Do we have enough trust in this world of rising fragmentation and refugee crisis and, and suspicions and bipartisanship? And I'm just wondering, are you, are you seeing light in the tunnel on, on, on the UN system, for example, or are you concerned about that? Because clearly what the conclusion I draw from yeah. what you're saying is that we need both yeah. and we need trust. Yes. Do we have it? That's a very good question, you know, and I struggle with it. So, so do I. Yeah, so do we. Yeah, <laughs> um, uh, so let me, let me try to put it in a, again in, a, in, a, in my own li lingo. Um, uh, I think we're moving into a world, uh, my cha I have a chapter on leadership and it's called Leading from the Middle. I think you have to lead from the middle now. Mm. Um, not from the top, not from the bottom, you have to lead. All, I think the best leadership in the world happens from the middle. So what do I mean by that? I mean it in, in, in three different ways. Um, uh, I did a book in 2011 called That Used to Be Us. Um, it was about America and, and, and that used to be us. And um, uh, I interviewed a guy named uh, um, Kurt Carlson who ran SRI, Stanford Research Institute. Um, great um, uh, innovation shop. It's, it's, called, it's, it's called Siri. The reason it's called Siri is because they actually invented Siri and sold it to Steve Jobs. Um, and uh, it's af named after Stanford Research Institute. That's where the name okay. came from. So Kurt was talking to me about how they do innovation at, at Siri. And um, he said something to me that I, I stopped and I wrote down and I said, I'm henceforth calling that Carlson's Law. Um, and uh, I coined this in, in this book. So Carlson's Law is the following. In this sort of 
uh, globalized you know, world and uh, uh, hyper technology, everything top down today is dumb and slow. Everything bottom up is smart but chaotic. And therefore the sweet spot for leadership has to move down to the middle, not all the way down. That is, you've got to get closer to what's coming up because with, in, a, in a world of emergent and empowered citizens, man, you can get innovation from anybody anywhere. But that innovation needs to be edited, curated, and nurtured and inspired. You still need leaders, I believe. Um, but they, they, got, they can't be up here. They've got to be closer to that. But they need to be above it to see beyond it where it can go and where the world is going. If you want to know what happens when leaders fall all the way down, it's called Occupy Wall Street. Mm. Oh, we're wonderful. No leaders here. And we see what, what impact they had. It's also called the Arab Spring. Nobody's a leader. Well, when nobody's a leader, nobody gets led and you go nowhere. So somebody needs to be closer to it, but not in it. So in that way, you need to lead from the middle today. Second way you need to lead from the middle, I believe, is that I think all the great problems have only hybrid solutions. The idea that the left has all the answers or the right has all the answers is ludicrous. So I was explaining to Johan, I did a column three weeks ago um, called uh, Up With Extremism. Mm -hmm. And I explained my own politics, which is I'm a nonpartisan extremist. Um, I'm actually to the left of Bernie Sanders, if you're following our, pol our politics, and to the right of the editorial page of the Wall Street Journal. Um, uh, that is, I believe in, I want single payer health care in America. I want a minimum income, t uh, minimum income called negative income tax. I want full day um, uh, pre-K for every American. Um, uh, and I want a vastly expanded earned income tax credit. Um, I, I, I want to absolutely reinforce our social safety net in the world we're going into more than Bernie Sanders. What differentiates me from him is I have a way of paying for it. Um, which is, I think we should pay for it by abolishing all corporate taxes, all income taxes, and moving to a carbon tax, and a tax on sugar, and a tax on bullets. So um, uh, I, I want to, I'm actually to the right of the Wall Street Journal. Um, those guys want to cut taxes here and there. No, I want to get rid of all of them and actually shift to a transformational tax system that, will, that we can pay for this. So I want to lead from the middle the middle between these two extremes, which tends to get belittled, because if you say you're in the middle, they say you're a centrist. No, I'm not a pale version of Bernie Sanders in the Wall Street Journal. I'm actually more radical than both of them. So I think you gotta lead from the middle that way. The third way you have to lead from the middle is that in this world, everyone today um, is, it used to be I was walking around with a portable X-ray machine. It's called a smartphone. Today, this thing is a portable MRI oh man, I can see fine grain muscle now. And with this little device, I become automatically in one, just holding this thing, I am now a paparazzi, I am now a reporter, and I'm now a documentary filmmaker with this thing. And when everyone in the world is a reporter, paparazzi, and documentary filmmaker with no editor, filter, or libel lawyer, everybody else is a public figure. Oh, I can see right into you fine grain, I can tell the whole world about you. And in that kind of world, formal authority counts for nothing. Only moral authority is what's going to count. And therefore, the old day, hey, I'm in charge. Johan's in charge here. He can tell you what to do. Yeah, maybe, you, maybe you can get by with that for another year. But basically, you are not going to follow him around if he does not have moral authority, not just formal authority. And I think formal authority is dying everywhere. Even look at Putin, the problems he's going to have. So as a result of that, I'm a huge believer people do not listen through their ears. This is what I've learned as a reporter. People listen through their stomach. And if I can connect with you on the gut level, you're going to say, Tom, I trust your column. You just go write it. If I can't connect with you on the gut level, I can't show you enough details. Can I just see that one more time? Can I just go over that quote one more time? And moral authority is going to be coming more and more important, and moral authority comes from the middle. There's a Talmudic injunction my teacher, Duff Seidman, always reminds me of, which is what comes from the heart enters the heart. And what doesn't come from the heart doesn't enter the heart. And in a more connected, transparent world, people who can lead from the middle 
are going to have so much more leverage. So for all those reasons, you need a politics of the middle, you need to lead from the middle, okay? And you also need to lead from the middle, I call it both vertically and horizontally. You know, you've got to move to the middle of the spectrum, but not as a wishy-washy blend of left and right. No, I'm not a pale version of them. I'm actually a more radical version of both. Hmm. And it could be that Sweden is an interesting place for you to start a new political party. Yeah, it's, um, I got to start with my own country. We are about to have an election between a socialist and a fascist, and, and um, uh, that, that hasn't happened, I don't know, a long time. You know, I mean, I thought one went out in 89 and the other in 45, but never mind. We may be testing the theory that democracies are incredibly adaptable. So, um, You have, and I think um, many, if not most of us, has, have been very inspired by your episodes in, in the fantastic uh, series of Years of Living Dangerously. And you have a sequence there. Not surprisingly, it focuses a lot on your 30-year experience in the Middle East and, and your social, ecological explorations in Syria. But you have a sequence there which, which inspires or, or which triggers a lot of thinking. And, and I should say, I think it, it applies everywhere, not only in the Middle East, but you're speaking to young Arabs where basically you come into conversations saying that we've tried Islamism, yeah. we've tried communism, we've tried capitalism, we've tried, you know, basically every ism in this world apart from one, which is environmentalism. And that might be the way forward for an integrated trust-based transformation in regions of great turbulence, such as the Middle East. And I would argue that that applies for the yeah. US and Sweden as well. Absolutely. Now, what, what's your thinking there on the, on the ideological evolution? I mean, given your discussions here about the kind of socialist, fascist yeah. um, extremism and in, in, in even the political run-up in the US, where do you think ideologies are moving? And where do, you, where do you think environmentalism is moving? And do you see, by the way, a trend towards this more pragmatic, anthropocentric, innovation-oriented environmentalism as, 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 as you're kind of representing in a way? That's a really interesting question, you know, and I, I, I'd have to just take a different bites of it. That um, I, I was saying to um, uh, Johan and his colleagues earlier this morning that one thing I learned in covering the Middle East, there's actually two groups in the Arab world today who look at the Middle East as a completely borderless region, ISIS and the environmentalists. So one thing they have in common. ISIS sees it as a single religious system, and the environmentalists see it as a single hydrological system. But they both understand, unless you manage it as a single system, uh, you know, you're not going to thrive. Uh, I don't think ISIS is going to thrive, but in their own uh, warped way. So what I would, what I, uh, having covered the Arab world for 30 years, I, I heard you know, young Arabs always say, you know, we've tried everything. We tried Nasserism, socialism, communism, liberalism, Islamism, and nothing worked. And my answer is always, there's one ism you haven't tried, and that's environmentalism. And I'm not being cute here, because environmentalists start with the commons. Mm. And they understand that there's no Shiite air, and there's no Sunni water, there's no Kurdish soil, you know, uh, and there's no um, you know, Turkmen uh, vegetation. It's just all one system. And until and unless they back away from uh, a sectarian view of the world and adopt an ecological view, Mother Nature is going to kill them all so much faster than they kill each other. Um, and pay attention, two governments fell there this summer over air conditioning, basically. Uh, the Iraqi prime minister fired all three vice presidents last July when the um, uh, heat index at the northern tip of the Persian Gulf hit 161 degrees. Uh, it was 121 degree Fahrenheit, and then it was 90 degree humidity. The heat index, what it felt like to be outside, was 161 <coughs> degrees, and the Iraqi government um, had, had the air conditioning failed, which is not surprising, and he had to have someone to blame, so he fired his three vice presidents. <coughs> so uh, what, what I think the, the failure of a lot of a political analysis, you want to give that as an example, and of course, I, what I did in years of living dangerously was go to northern Syria, to Raqqa province. Raqqa province, gosh, wherever, oh, that's where ISIS is headquartered. Mm. Raqqa province was also the ground zero for the worst drought in Syria's modern history from 2006 to 2010. Um, a million Syrian farmers and herders centered in Raqqa province, <coughs> left their homes, left all their cattle died, all their crops died. They flocked to the cities. The um, uh, Assad did nothing for them. They completely overwhelmed the infrastructure. And so they didn't start the revolution, but as soon as it started, they were the first to join. Farmers and herders. These are conservative people. 
These are not urban elites who went to Damascus University. They couldn't wait to start the revolution. I believe you can find this, that the revolution in Syria started in the two driest spots in the country, Dara and Kamishla. Mm. So, um, and of course, it's now controlled by, rock, by, by ISIS. So, um, uh, this is the, the, the interaction between these two uh, is very much part of the way I, I look at the world. I was giving a Johan example earlier that I, a part of this documentary, we did Egypt. So Egypt is a story of wheat, the wheat crisis. So um, wheat prices in Egypt went up sevenfold uh, when? In 2010. What happened in 2010? Uh, wildfires, drought in Russia, China, and Australia, and flooding um, completely collapsed the world's wheat uh, uh, market, um, and wheat prices soared. And in uh, December 2010, the World Food Organization announced that their basket of food prices hit the all-time record high. Mm. December 2010, geez, when did that vegetable seller in Tunisia um, uh, you know, burn himself up? I guess it was December mm. 2010. That's right. So we actually started the story about Egypt in, uh, uh, in Salina, Kansas, in the heart of the wheat belt in America, and I did an interview with um, Wes Jackson, who is an amazing uh, bioscientist who's trying to form a, trying to develop a, uh, a, a, um, a perennial form of, of, uh, uh, um, of, of uh, not a perennial, a, um, uh, um, anyway, sustainable form of wheat. Um, and uh, he was explaining to me the history of the prairie. And he said, Tom, you have to understand, the prairie was a natural polyculture. Uh, it was a system that naturally fertilized and pollinated and, um, uh, and created its own natural pesticides. What we did is, uh, when we came out here, the white Europeans, is we plowed up the prairie and we planted monoculture crops, wheat, corn, and sorghum. And to be sustained, they needed massive amounts of high-density fossil fuels in the form of tractors, pesticides, and fertilizers. When the Dust Bowl happened, all the, prairie, all the monoculture crops died, um, uh, and all the prairie survived, the remaining parts of the prairie, because they were naturally polyculture resilient, healthy interdependent system. And when he said that, I said, you know, it's really interesting, Wes, when you think about it, what is Al Qaeda doing? Al Qaeda in the Middle East is trying to wipe out the polyculture of the Islamic world. The Islamic world was at its, at its most economic and greatest political power when? In Moorish Spain, uh, between the eighth and 13th century, when it was the world's greatest polyculture of ideas, of commerce, of trade. They're trying to wipe out Islam as a polyculture, and instead, and by the way, they're leveraging high-density fossil fuels from uh, Gulf Arab oil states to wipe out the polyculture of the Muslim world and replace it with a monoculture that's enormously susceptible to diseased ideas. When you think about our politics in America, the same thing is going on. The Tea Party in America is using high-density fossil fuels from the Koch brothers and other American oil companies to wipe out the polyculture of the Republican Party. The Republican Party at its height was an amazing polyculture. Teddy Roosevelt gave us the National Park System. Richard Nixon gave us the Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, and the EPA. Uh, George Bush, the father, gave us cap and trade. It was a polyculture. And these guys are trying to use high density fossil fuel donations from the oil industry to wipe out the polyculture of the Republican Party and replace it with a monoculture that's enormously susceptible to diseased ideas. And it gave you Donald Trump, okay? Um, so the interaction between polycultures in nature and polycultures in politics and their relation to fossil fuels, I think are totally interwoven. Mm. And as we discussed earlier, I mean, one of the red threads in the resilience science here is really that investing in nurturing and safeguarding and, and developing diversity, redundancy and flexibility yeah rides right across from local ecosystems to biomes to financial systems. Yeah. And this is exactly the kind of, exactly the same, same conclusion as, as you were drawing yeah. from, from your observations. Uh, before we close, I'm just a little bit interested in, in, in your thoughts. I mean, this is one of the areas that we are increasingly trying to develop scientific methodologies around to try and use resilience theory and our social ecological systems approach across scales in, in, the, in the Moore's law, right. multiple exponential rise uh, reality of the world, 
to be able to uh, analytically uh, foresee where are we likely to see the kind of social ecological abrupt changes in the future, as you've just described, for example, in the Arab Spring, in Syria, as we've had examples in Sudan uh, before that. I mean, do you have any, if you take your crystal ball, what, where do you think you'll be traveling next uh, as, a, as a reporter, as someone who really is, uh, is trying to understand these complex abrupt changes where you are, are, are seeing hotspot regions in the world mm -hmm. where you think uh, we should, as, as an advice to us, um, deepen our, our, our scientific efforts? Well, the one that's most obvious to me, and I'm, I'm sure to you all as well, is certainly China, you know, because mm -hmm. that's where you have the ecological uh, stresses at scale, meeting with the financial and the political. Yeah. You know, and um, uh, can they um, keep this system going? I mean, you know, I, I did a column last week in which I said uh, uh, that I can uh, ruin any dinner party. Um, and um, uh, <clears throat> I, I do breakfast also. And um, <laughs> Because uh, every once in a while I get really scary because my mind works in very horizontal ways and I do a lot of arbitrage in my head. And I, I just sort of laid out, what if a whole bunch of epics are all ending at the same time right now? Yeah. You know, wh what if we're at the end of the China growth epic? What if we're at the end of the $100, I hope, of their oil epic? You know? uh, what if we're, end at the e we're at the end of the EU epic? Um, what if we're at the end of the gentle climate act, but, but right now up against the planetary boundaries and about to pierce through them? What if all these epics are ending at once? Self-accelerating. Exactly. And that that's what the market is telling us. Um, and uh, that that's actually what you're seeing out there. And I, my gut, I have a pit in my stomach that that's actually what's going on. Mm. And um, uh, we're bumping up against that. And what scares me is that um, the, I think the beauty of the work you're doing um, you know, is that uh, you're illuminating all the connections out there. Because again, go back to my model of how do you write a column. Well, you know, if I don't know how the machine works, mm. I can't make good political decisions, and I don't think I can write a good column. You know what I mean? Mm. Um, and uh, and that's why it's so important. If you don't know where you're going, as they say, any road will get you there. You know. So at this moment in time. The idea that 30% of Americans are ready to vote for someone who does not believe in climate change, um, who thinks that he can um, stop all these uh, forces because he built a great hotel once in Miami, um, uh, is so scary uh, to me. You know that 30% so many people are ready to buy this, uh, and 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 this is the point where I should say that um, my book has a theme song. Um, uh, and uh, I'm actually trying to buy the song, so when you open the book cover, it'll play the song like a birthday <laughs> card plays Happy Birthday. And uh, the song is called, uh, uh, it's by Brandy Carlisle. I'm a big Brandy Carlisle fan. She's a country folk singer. And the song is called The Eye, E-Y-E. -E. And the main refrain of the song is, you can dance in a hurricane as long as you're standing in the eye. And I think that's the whole problem in one verse of a song. I think these three climate changes at once are the equivalent of a giant hurricane. Now what Trump is selling is a wall, figuratively and literally. He's got the right diagnosis. There's a hurricane out there, folks, and I, the great King Canute, uh, Donald Trump, um, are going to build a wall against that hurricane. And my argument is that, that this hurricane will blow down any wall. What you need is an eye. You need to be able to move with the hurricane, draw energy from it, and at the same time have a place of stability and resilience and healthy interdependence. It's not a perfect analogy, but it, it's roughly directionally right. And I talk about the community I grew up in as both my anchor and my sail. And that's what we all need. The more I'm anchored, the more I want to sail and go far, reach out, experiment and explore. But if all you have is a, a wall to hide behind, you're never going to be resilient because you're never going to be pluralistic. You're never going to be experimental. You're never going to take chances. And um, I'm horrified at the direction um, you know, part of America is going right now because I think um, uh, it does get amplified around the world. And it would be a, a, it's, it's a very dangerous moment and that's why having a place like that, you've got to get it right. You know, if you don't know how the machine works, you can really push it in the wrong direction. 
mm. or not push it at all. And I think we have people, I mean, I, you know, I, uh, we have, I mean, there are neo-Nazi parties in Europe that believe in climate change, all right? And, and in America, we have, are one of our two major parties doesn't believe in, you know what I mean? And um, that's like really scary. You know, I don't know that we, we, we have a group of people who believe you can be dumb as we want to be. And um, at this kind of moment of acceleration, see, when, when you only need to go 20 miles at 20 miles an hour, or if you have a leader who you get off course with, it's no problem, you get back on course. But when you're going 2,000 miles an hour and need to go 2,000 miles, if you get off course now, that's what happened in the Arab world, it can be fatal. Hmm. And these, there are countries there that will never, because the, the price of getting back on course is so fundamental of a transformation, they can't do it. And um, that's, to me, the, the real danger and challenge of this moment. That's why leadership really matters. Mm. Um, and um, uh, I don't think we're treating it seriously. Mm. No, and we're not taking the, the, the pace of transformative yeah. change seriously enough. So even though, as, as you also have pointed out, <coughs> the political leadership in the world has made major step forward, <coughs> even wrote, write a very important op in the New York Times about 2015 with the SDGs and climate deal was a big, big deal. Yeah. But as, as we discussed this morning, it, it doesn't translate to the recognition of the depth of systemic change that needs to occur in the world. And, and you may um, destroy dinners, but you certainly don't destroy a lunch <laughs> here with, with colleagues at the Resilience Center because you encapsulate you know, the very heart entry point for our social ecological research for resilience and sustainability in the Anthropocene which actually takes exactly the starting point of understanding yeah. the multiple exponential interconnected dynamic drivers of change, but then also exploring the pathways towards transformation where we can combine human well-being through sustainable and resilient pathways across scales. And uh, clearly, I think that your, your advice to us of this hybrid middle scale interactive as a governance and management uh, system is something that we'll, we'll bring with us from this discussion. You know, and, it, um, so we're yeah. you know, very grateful I for, it. for this. Well, uh, I would just say, you know, I mean, uh, uh, back at you, as we say, I'm not here by accident. I mean, I, I, um, uh, I, I get to see a lot of people producing a lot of stuff around the world. Um, and um, uh, I think what you're doing here is, is really impressive and really unique, and that's why I, I've come to Stockholm. You know, and uh, um, I'm so glad that I did. What people don't appreciate is the, how much is changing, how fast it's changing. Exactly. And um, yeah, I wrote a book in 2004 called The World is Flat. Um, and then I, I wrote a, another book in 2011 called That Used to Be Us, it was about America. But when I sat down to write the new book in 2011, the first thing I did was I got the first edition of The World is Flat off my bookshelf. Just to remind myself what I wrote. And uh, I opened it up to the index. And I looked under A, B, C, D, E, F, A, C, E, B. Facebook wasn't in. So when I was running around the world in 2004 telling people, folks, the world is flat, we're all connected, Facebook didn't exist. Twitter was still a sound. The cloud was still in the sky. 4G was a parking place. LinkedIn was a prison. Applications were what you sent to college. Big data was a rap star, and Skype was a typographical error. <laughs> All of that happened in seven years between two books. And if you aren't paying attention to that, you know what I mean, and you think you can wear a hat around that says, let's you know, make America great again, and that's going <laughs> to get the job done. Um, and again, he's just such an easy target, but it's so horrifying to me um, <laughs> that uh, that we're, we're actually talking about him, and that I, we had Sarah Palin back, and it's just like <laughs> endorsing, Trump. endorsing him. I mean, if that isn't a sign of the apocalypse, I don't know what it is. You know, it just, uh, uh, you know, that it's scary. So uh, I just think the work you're doing is so important, um, and uh, I, I thank you for having me here and, and for sharing it with me. Thank you Thanks, very much. but I, I, can, I can assure you we're not entering American politics. <laughs> anyway, um, let, let me also say that thank you very much for for um, 
flagging that it's not a coincidence that you came to Sweden, but you did fly from Davos here, and uh, of course, everyone was very jealous that you went to Stockholm instead of going back to Washington yeah. with, uh, <laughs> with the modern history's worst yeah, snow blizzard exactly, ever. Right, yeah. You would have never made it anyway, yeah, so you had to come had here. Come here. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, thanks so much, Tom. A thank clap you. of hand to you. Thank and, you. Uh, thank you.